Hello and thank you for joining me. I'm your host, Greg Bray, and this is Inspiring Doubt. This is the first time Inspiring Doubt has had its own video broadcast. For the past several years, we've existed on Facebook. Check us out at www.inspiringdoubt.com, where you can find the page, like us, and make sure that uh, you send me a friend request as well. In this show now, the goal is to promote skepticism and critical thinking in an entirely new venue and with bringing on various guests that can have engaging conversations and can really help to nuance and to demonstrate how incredibly important critical thinking is in the world today. As a skeptic, I'm a person who has dedicated myself to questioning everything that I think that I know. It's a uh, it sounds like an endeavor that could be overwhelming, and frankly, it can be. If you, you take a very philosophical approach to it, you end up thinking that you may just be a brain in a jar somewhere, the Matrix, but I'm not talking about the absolute Cartesian skepticism. This is skepticism as applied in daily life. It is critical thinking and trying to, in every way that we can, be as confident as possible that our beliefs are based on reality and what actually is. Of course, we have to assume that reality exists outside of us. That's okay. I'm, I'm all right with making a couple of basic assumptions, but inspiring doubt is once you're past those assumptions, how can you be sure that you're not getting conned, fooled, tricked, huckstered, or otherwise manipulated into believing something that you that, that may not be true, either by somebody else or by yourself. And that's why today, for our first show, we have author Guy P. Harrison. He wrote his most recent book, is called Think, Why You Should Question Everything. This author has been incredibly influential in my journey through skepticism. One of his, uh, or his book was one of the first that I read uh, when I sort of branched out a bit um, beyond just the uh, Catholic catechism books that were being given to me as I was going through the RCIA program. And uh, I, I found this one. It's uh, 50 Reasons People Give for Believing in a God. Excellent book. What I love about Mr. Harrison's approach is that he, he writes for newcomers, people who are not entrenched in this idea and therefore his books are incredibly approachable they are friendly they're easy reads they're not intimidating in any way and frankly even the the they're broken up in nice little subheadings and the chapters at least this one the chapters are short um, the the subheadings in think are are short and easy to follow and and all delineated very clearly in the index or, or sorry the, the table of contents they're just excellent little guides to blossoming skeptics. I keep extra copies of his uh, 50 Reasons books on hand. I, I currently only have one copy of Think. But what's great about these is when I run into somebody who is new to the conversation, new to this sort of a topic, I love to give his book, specifically the books written by, again, our guest, author Guy P. Harrison, to anybody who's beginning to question for that exact reason. They are made for people who are really approaching this topic and, and new to it and, and I love the fact that they're not esoteric and academic in such a way that the new person is going to see say, oh, the greatest show on earth with its uh, 450 pages and it looks like about 60 pages of footnotes uh, in there, or, or endnotes, I should say, um, or one of the uh, many other incredible books for people who are a little bit more uh, versed, or a little bit better versed in skepticism. So this is my interview with Guy P. Harrison. It's for, again, the first episode of Inspiring Doubt. I hope that you join us for many, many more. And just to let you know, this interview was recorded in advance. This broadcast, actually, is part of a, a post-edit that I'm doing, and it will be loaded up on YouTube. But normally, the show airs live at 6 p.m. Central Time on Wednesdays. That is part of the New Covenant Group's YouTube channel. So find me there and again check out the website www.inspiringdoubt.com 
and like the page on Facebook, send me a friend request, look for us on Twitter, on Google+, and all of my shows will also be mirrored on my own YouTube channel, Inspiring Doubt. So, once again, with no further ado, this is my interview with Guy P. Harrison, author of Think, Why You Should Question Everything. Thank you for joining me, and it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Glad to be here. You are an author. You've written now five books uh, on this subject, including Race and Reality. Think is your most recent book. This is the, the first one other than Race and Reality that, that departed from the, the sort of structure of the 50 questions. I like this book. I've been rereading it over the last few days, um, and, and I think it's... Uh, an excellent guide for skepticism. Of course, here with Inspiring Doubt, that is our goal, is to promote critical thinking and, and scientific analysis of the world around you, or thinking like a scientist. And that seems to be the goal of this book as well. Can I ask you what inspired you to write this book specifically? Yeah, it, it's simple. Uh, I look around the world, I've traveled far and wide, I've met all sorts of people in high places, low places, and I see a consistent problem throughout humanity, weak skepticism. And I, you know, I've hit that theme repeatedly in my writing and different, coming at it from different angles. And I said, you know, I need to write just one book that I can hand to anyone. It's an all-purpose general guide to how to be, how to become a good skeptic, how to think like a scientist in everyday life. And this is that book. I worked really hard to keep it nice and thin, you know, it's not a thick book, it's easy to read it. Some of the, some of the topics are complex and challenging, but I, I struggled, I worked my butt off to make them, to, to write about them in a way that a high school kid could easily grasp and, 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 and feel, hopefully feel inspired. And when they close the book, they, I, I want people to close this book after reading it and say, you know what, wow. I'm going to be a good skeptic. I'm going to work at it. I'm, I'm not going to be a sucker. I'm not going to be a victim if I can help it. Because as I say in the book, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how innately intelligent you may be. It doesn't matter how wonderful your educational accomplishments may be. If you are a human being with a human brain, then you've got one foot in fantasy land, and you are set up <laughs> to believe in nonsense and to be constantly fooled when it comes to perceiving reality and what's not reality. So this book gives people, one, the tools. The, it shows you how you can really uh, put the, the skills of a good skeptic into play in your everyday life. And it also, like I said, hopefully inspires people to care about their brain and keep weeding it to keep the nonsense out. Because when you're a good skeptic, there's no guarantees in life. Anything bad can always happen. But if you're a good skeptic, you are more likely to lead a much more efficient, safer, and productive life. Thank you. That's uh, really well put. I'm going to ask, though, can you elaborate a little bit more on weak skepticism? That's something that you've uh, covered quite a bit in your books, but what do you mean by weak skepticism yeah, as opposed the, to how, what you promote? Yeah, the reason I always say, you know, strive to become a good skeptic instead of just be a skeptic, or because we're all skeptics. We're all skeptical to some t degree. Okay, I, I've met people who believe a hundred crazy things. But when it comes to UFOs, ah, no way, I'm not falling for that nonsense. You know, we all have, no matter who you are, <laughs> no matter who, who the person is, there, there's going to be some things they believe that might be a little irrational, and there's going to be other things they're forcefully skeptical about. For example, just look at religion. Some of the best skeptics I have met when it comes to Christianity are Muslims. They rip the Bible up. They've got. They've really looked into it, and vice versa. Some of the best skeptics of Islam that I've ever met are Christians. You know, so when I, when I talk about being a good skeptic, one of the one of the things is you have to be consistent. You have to apply it to everything because we're we're vulnerable. We're weak when it comes to authority figures. If our parent tells us something is true, we're inclined to believe it, and most times that's probably a good idea. Sometimes we even have to question mom and dad, especially later in life, maybe when you're off on your own. you got to think for yourself. Um, tradition is a big thing. Just because it's always been done this way doesn't mean it's right or true. Popularity is a big problem. You know, Truth and reality 
cannot be determined by popular vote. Okay, a lot of times the majority is just plain wrong. So all these things you got to keep in mind. And when I say be a good skeptic, it's kind of an ongoing process. You're never quite there. You're always working at it. And I, sh I should mention another good, another important uh, a key to being a good skeptic is you got to keep an open mind. I, I, sh I work at that all the time. And it's hard. It's hard because you get to a point you think you've got it all figured out. You know, this is nonsense. That's nonsense. But no, that you've got to keep an open mind because you never know. The history of scientific discovery shows us that the weirdest stuff can turn out to be true. So you've got to keep that mind willing to change. You know, if better evidence comes along, you've got to let go of your conclusions. You've got to change. Changing your mind is not a weakness. It's not a fault. It's the sign of being a good skeptic and a wise person. You mentioned trying to write a book that's sort of easy to read, and, and that's one thing that I, I really love about all of your books, actually. It's the reason that I, I purchase copies of them to give out to other people is because, frankly, there's a lot written on this subject in general or on more specific parts of it. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at a, a shelf full of very esoteric uh, descriptions, and even things... Uh, I've got a couple books by Michael Shermer, which I love and I've, I've uh, recommended to other people, and they just seem to bristle at them to, to some extent. And that's I really appreciate that about your style. You share a lot of personal stories. You write in a very approachable manner. Uh, and try not to be in your face or derogatory uh, when it comes to uh, these beliefs. And, and frankly, I, I love the way that you even share some of your own personal uh, misgivings or, or uh, I guess, missteps um, throughout your development as well. I love the story from the beginning of your... Uh, your most recent book, Think, um, where you talk about uh, believing in space aliens. And, and then you go on, I think, that's, uh, I love when you, you bring that sort of back around and give the example of Gretchen uh, later on, uh, the, the fictional story. Uh, that you... let, let, me, let me note, just for my own fragile ego, I was only 10 years old at the time, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't fall for it yesterday. But yeah, oh. that, that, that incident, ha I think, influenced me. It was part of the process of me you know, questioning things because as a child I saw this documentary, Chariots of the Gods, the, the TV documentary, and it blew me away because all this, you know, evidence was there and it looked so compelling and convincing. And about a few months later I saw another documentary on PBS. It was one of the Nova programs that just ripped it all to shreds and a light went off in my head. I went, aha, wait a minute. So if there's a guy on TV wearing a tie and he has a fancy title, doesn't necessarily mean he knows what he's talking about every time. You know, you have to you have to slow down and think about these things. And of course, uh, it leads to the question you bring about. Or you bring up the uh, guy in a, a fancy suit and tie, um, not necessarily having all the answers. The same is true of an author that writes a book. I feel I'd be remiss to not uh, mention the the irony that everybody perceives in your subtitle and why you should question everything. Yeah, well, you should question everything, even. Me saying you should question everything. Question that too. You know, yeah. You know, I can't even remember. I go round and round with these publishers all the time. I think think was definitely my my suggested title. I why you should question everything. I think was theirs. I can't I can't remember now exactly. Because I usually whenever I whenever I propose a book, I do a few suggested titles and then they tell me to shut up and they put what they want on it. You know, I, who am I? I'm just the author. You know, but but um, yeah, I can't remember exactly. But uh. Yeah, I've heard all sorts of things, of, you know, well, I'm skeptical of your skepticism, and so I'm like, great, man, be skeptical of everything. That's one, that's one of the things in all my books. Somewhere in there, it's worked in pretty plain to see, where I say, look, I'm not telling you what to believe, how to think. I'm trying to inspire you and show you how to think for yourself. Okay, that's a constant theme in my writings and my work. I want people to go off on their own and be better thinkers for their own good, okay? I'm not, I, I'm not some guy claiming to have the universe figured out, to have some ultimate truth, nothing like that at all. I'm just saying, stop trusting everything you hear and everything you're told. Stop trusting your fragile human brain that leads you astray more times than you can imagine. I mean, our brains are loaded with these processes that just, just like make us bumbling idiots in many circumstances throughout life. And it's nothing to be ashamed of. doesn't mean you're dumb or crazy. It's part of being human. It comes with the territory. But if, if you've got to be aware of this, you know. If I saw a ghost right now in the middle of this interview, you know, it freaked me out. It looked completely real. 
but I would know enough about the human brain to stop short of saying there are absolutely ghosts in the universe. I know that now. I would say no. I said that was a fascinating, you know, event, but I need more evidence because I know an eyewitness account, even my own, is not enough. And you know, it's also important is uh, for good skeptics to be humble. You've got to be humble. You've got to know that your mind is fallible. You're not perfect. You're going to make mistakes in your reasoning. You have and you will. And there are things rattling around in your head right now which are probably not true or real, that you think are real. You've got to be humble. I always tell people, if you're, you know, skeptics have this uh, rep of being arrogant jerks. And, you know, among, many believers will say, oh, you people are know-it-alls. You, you think you are. And I always explain, look, man, if a skeptic is arrogant, he ain't doing it right. Okay? <laughs> You've got to be humble. Because a good skeptic, that's the person that says, Man, I don't have all the answers. I don't know what is going on. You know, I'm doing the best I can. I'm trying to figure out what's real, and I'm never quite 100% sure about anything because things change as more evidence comes in. So skeptics, good skeptics, are the most humble people in the world, in my opinion. I, I love that you focus so much on the humility. Very often it's self-referential, or, or we, um, in the way that you bring it up. And I, I love that, that it's uh, described in a, a manner of saying everybody has these faults and everybody has these weaknesses. Yeah, I, I never, I never assume I am smarter than someone just because they have stumbled into an irrational belief that I have been able to avoid. Because, you know, it's sometimes highly intelligent people are more vulnerable to believing nonsense simply because they're so intelligent and their minds work overtime at compiling evidence on one side of the equation. And, you know, because of confirmation bias, they ignore all the evidence that contradicts it. It's just part of being human. So I'm very, uh, I've always been very sympathetic. I, I'm very understanding when it comes to people who believe crazy stuff. Because, you know, it could be me. It could be you. It could be any of us. Uh, you know, I have to say from personal anecdote here, which is, of course, the most reliable kind of evidence, um, that uh, for me, the, uh, the people that have been the most impressive with the, the wild beliefs they can hold to me, have always been the most intelligent people that I, I've met. I'm, there's, yeah, okay, I've run into some people that don't strike me as particularly intelligent that, that can bring about some striking beliefs, but uh, frankly, I see a whole lot more of it. Uh, it well, it, here's my anecdote. One of my very best friends growing up, this person is the biggest conspiracy theorist I know, uh, uh, and everything about it. What, what I've noticed about that is, uh, it, I think at least, his ability to convince other people that he's right is this huge amount of a, or it's a huge reinforcing factor. Uh, I think being intelligent in many ways uh, is a way that you can talk your way in, or talk other people into believing what you have. And what is more confidence building than getting somebody else to say, yeah, you're right. Yeah, like reality is not something to be decided like we decide things in a courtroom. You know, if you have the best lawyer, she or he may be able to present an overwhelming case that wins. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's really what happened. You know, you know what I mean? But it's, it's, yeah, again, it's, it's great you said conspiracy theorists because they, in my experience too, they are the best, man. They're, they're some of the smartest people. They just, they will overwhelm you with mountains of evidence. <laughs> they work so hard at it, you know, even though there's probably nothing there. And, you know, so, yeah, I, I always back to the theme of, you know, you've got to be humble. You've got to understand this is not about being uneducated or, or dumb necessarily. Not at all, not at all. It's about being human. So I, I noted from your, uh, your first chapter, you have sort of a bulleted um, endpoint in your, uh, your think book uh, that says it's good thinking is the, the heading for it. And the very first bullet here is weak skepticism is perhaps the greatest unrecognized global crisis of all. Every day people waste time, throw away money, suffer, and even die because they failed to think like a scientist. Can I ask you to elaborate on that? I really want to drive in the point uh, with these first couple shows about why skepticism is so important and, and why critical thinking is. So can you uh, flesh that out a bit more? What is, uh, I, I think, the thing that drives you to push this idea and not just accept it for yourself? Yeah, what, what motivated me or drove me or... Uh compelled me to 
get busy and write some books about this subject is some of the things I've seen. A lot of people think the whole issue of promoting skepticism and critical thinking, it's just about debunking psychics or or arguing about the existence of ghosts, you know, or astrology or Atlantis, you know, things that on the surface at least are fairly benign. But not at all, not at all. I, I have seen people literally suffer. I, I know of people who, I, I know cases people, where people die as a direct result of being weak skeptics. I've been around the world and I've seen the poorest of the poor squandering their pennies, their few pennies, on stuff that is just total garbage, you know, buying, buying uh, books that explain how they can buy winning lottery tickets by interpreting their dreams. You know, they'll spend a fourth of their paycheck on that book, you know, when they've got five kids to worry about. You know, I've seen this stuff. I, uh, in the Caribbean, I was in a, st a soccer stadium filled with thousands of people, mostly poor people, as Benny Hinn stood up in a stage, you know, the uh, faith healer preacher guy from the U.S. Mm -hmm. He swooped in on his private jet and he mesmerized them all and he sucked up every loose nickel in that stadium and flew away, you know, and I've seen this stuff and it, and it just breaks my heart and I, you know, people uh, who don't, who aren't good skeptics waste money, risk their good health by, you know, falling for all sorts of medical quackery uh, people do horrible things to their children, even though they love their children and they want the best for their children. I'm not talking about bad parents. I'm talking about good parents who love their children but harm their children because they're weak skeptics. I mean, it goes on and on and on. And so I tell people, like, look, for me, this thing is a moral issue. It really is. I mean, I can't look at the world as it is and not speak out. I have to speak up because... I, I think there are few things, there are few aspects of humanity that we could make more improvement uh, by spending less money, and less effort really, than just raising the level of skeptical thinking in the world. My gosh, I mean, we could, we could save millions of lives every year, literally, I'm not exaggerating, millions of lives. We could enhance and improve billions of lives, you know much less time wasted. I mean, there's so many. I could go on and on about it. But yeah, for me, skeptical thinking is an absolute moral imperative. It's it's, it's the thing. I, I would feel guilty if I just lived my life and I watched all these people floundering around in all this swamp of nonsense, you know, harming themselves and others, and I didn't speak out. I'd feel like a dirtbag, so I have to do it. And I have to say that was a, a huge awakening for me as well, was traveling. I, I grew up in the Midwest. I live in Wisconsin, and it's, uh, for me, um, pretty benign. I mean, we, we see, uh, I mean, there's a psychic who has her shop set up down the street, uh, Psychic Readings by Monica, and, of course, no recording devices are allowed on the premises, and uh, it's by appointment only. But the, <laughs> I always found that ironic, but um, that is the kind of, uh, of, weak skepticism that I run into on a regular basis, sort of uh, um, mild and, and generally benign superstitions. But it was uh, not until I traveled while I was going through my undergrad and, and started to see um, the real harms that this can bring about. And, and then, of course, started reading and learning more about the world as my, my skeptical awakening occurred. And seeing the, uh, the link between poverty and and I don't know if I even want to say weak skepticism so much as superstition. Um, I think that extreme poverty uh, is one of the major factors in that, and it's uh, um, a difficult thing, therefore, for us to help with this. Do you have any uh, thoughts of how um, that we can promote skepticism and, uh, and good critical thinking for people in developing countries or uh, other things. I mean, you've, you've been there. You've done this, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The first thing is what what you've mentioned already. Talk in plain English. You know, have, have a simple message. It's, it's about the idea, not about wooing people with your, your wonderful phrases and your terminology and all that. Uh, if you're writing short sentences, simple words, it's the power of the idea. I want you to think for yourself. I want you to ask questions. Not for me, but for you. It's good for you. It's good for the world. <laughs> okay? People, anyone, anywhere, 
can at least understand the message I'm offering. Whether they accept it or not, that's their choice. But you, you don't have to get too fancy about this, okay? You, you, I, I like to use stories and examples. They're universal. I tell stories. You know, I, I, um, I even have one in my book, Think. I, I made up a fictional story about a little girl who's brilliant, but she sees a UFO and she gets carried away with it and it ends up messing up her life. You know, and I just, examples like that. And I, I, um, I try to show people how they are so skeptical in some aspects of their life, but in others, they don't even imagine questioning. They don't even think. Your so candy bar is a great one on that. I, I love oh, right. the uh, candy bar analogy when you're talking about uh, yeah, yeah, some, hey, if, yeah, if somebody, somebody walked up to you and said, hey, here's a candy bar, it's the best one in the world. This candy bar tastes so good and it's already been opened. And, you, and they say, this will cure cancer, and it tastes better than any candy bar you've ever had. Give me five bucks. Come on. Nobody's. Well, most people would say no because they're skeptical, right? Well, that's you got to be. Everything's a candy bar. If somebody comes to you and says, hey, this herbal tea will prevent diabetes, it's a candy bar. It's, it's the same old candy bar thing. You've got to be skeptical, man. You've got to ask questions. You know, <clears throat> you mentioned... Uh, reasons to promote skeptical thinking. You know, just in America right now, people we're talking about all oh, the healthcare, the problems with healthcare, the the recession, the bad economy, unemployment, all these things. Yeah, but we still throw away billions of dollars on just medical quackery alone. You know, fifteen to twenty billion dollars a year at least medical quackery just in this one country. Okay. That's money we could be spending on other things, maybe like books for your children, or maybe real health care, or, you know, I mean, there's, it's just heartbreaking that we waste so much, and what really gets me is that it's just not on the radar, you know, parents don't teach it to their children, teachers don't teach it in the classrooms, and politicians never mention critical thinking, you know, it's, it's just not on popular culture's radar, and it needs to be, because like, like I said, it's, it's the great unrecognized global crisis. I have to ask you, um, it is, do you have a favorite sort of magical thinking that you like to uh, learn about or study, engage, anything like that? Um, yeah, they all interest me in one way or another. Probably UFOs. I love, because I love, I, I've always loved space. You know, I'm a Star Trek fan as a child on the original series. You know, I was a big fan. And I think the, uh, the idea of belief in UFOs, you know, I've, I even mentioned the book. I, I have the mind of a UFO skeptic. I'm not convinced because there's no evidence. But I have the heart of a UFO believer. You know, I want there to be something out there. I think there probably is based on the size of the universe and the opportunities. Um, but there's no reason to believe it. There's no reason to think we're being visited or anything like that because simply nobody's presented any credible evidence. But, uh, yeah, I love thinking about it. And what, one of the things I do is um, I try to do, like, a bait and switch with a lot of people. Like, uh, for example, cryptozoology. You know, people who are convinced that Bigfoot is out there running around or the Loch Ness Monster is swimming somewhere. I say, you know, yeah, maybe, maybe, could be. You know, and if you find it, let me know. I'll be the first to freak out about it and be happy. You know, I'll, I'll love finding that out. But I don't think it's real. I say, but you know what? Instead of running around in the woods trying to catch Bigfoot, who's probably not there, why don't you get into microbiology or marine biology? Because there's monsters all over this world, and many waiting to be discovered, I'm sure. You know, you talk about the depths of the ocean, what's there. I just read the other day that an estimated one-third of all the Earth's biomass, the whole planet, every living thing on the Earth, about a third of it lives beneath the ocean floor, okay, not in the ocean, not on the ocean floor, under the muck of the bottom of the seas. That's how much that's how much microbial gunk and life is living down there. I mean it's unbelievable. And we know nothing hardly about what's going on down there. It's just it's a whole nother universe of life. You know, the rainforest. Uh, an entomologist goes into the Amazon rainforest, he comes back with, you know, a hundred new insect species that he has to spend the next year cataloging and naming. I mean, the, the world is so, it's just, there's so many opportunities still for discovery. Even on our own bodies, we are covered in microbes, we've got microbes in us. We still don't even know everything about the ecosystem that is us, humanity. 
I mean, so if you're into to new creatures, weird animals, monsters, well, real science has you covered. That's where you want to go. Either become a scientist or become a fan of science and learn about this stuff. You don't need to sacrifice rational thinking to get thrills. You know, you don't, if you're into UFOs, check out the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI. Check out NASA's astrobiology efforts. I mean, real stuff is going on. Probes are exploring other worlds right now. We are looking for life. We may find it. Maybe not, but we might. That's exciting. That has a better chance of a payoff than searching for the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> yeah, I, I would have to agree there. And I I uh, noted in your book when you were talking about the, um, the assessment of... Um, of sources and and the confirmation bias that people, especially the true believers and the UFO believers, have, is that things like the or SETI and NASA are and astrobiology are often sort of overlooked in favor of blogs and other various things. I, I, do you have any sort of? I mean, you you talk about heuristics in your book and rules of thumb that make it easy, um, but one of the biggest things that uh, I struggle with running into other people um, that it, it is selection of sources, identifying what is a good trustworthy source and what is probably not as great of an idea to follow. Um, do you have any sort of rules of thumb that you can recommend for that? Yeah, um, more is better generally, but there's not, there's not, I'll say this up front, there's nothing foolproof. I don't care if the most distinguished science in the, scientist in the world says something. I always go, wow, that's exciting, but I don't really let it I don't engrave it in stone on my forehead, you know. I don't, I don't go crazy with it because uh, one thing, for example, I'm a big fan. I have an academic background in anthropology. I'm a big fan of paleoanthropology, early hominids, and all that stuff. Big fan of it. And every time they find, you know, a tooth or a mandible in Africa somewhere, there's all this media excitement. Oh, it's we're rewriting the whole book now, and oh, the missing link, and they get all excited, and I get excited. But I always temper it. I always chill out because I say, okay, well, let's see how it plays out over the next few years when the other anthropologists, you know, check it out, see what they have to say. And so you always have to be tentative no matter what the source is. Now, having said that, there's absolutely, absolutely some sources are better than others. Uh, you know, look, look at what the person, is their, is their area of expertise actually in the thing they're talking about? That's a big problem where people go wrong. They'll say, well, this guy is a scientist. You know, yeah, well, he has a PhD in chemistry. So why is he telling me about psychics? What's the connection here? Why is he trying to convince me psychics are real and you're flaunting his credentials? You know, I don't see the connection there. I'll still listen to him. I'll, listen, I'll show me the evidence, but uh, you got to be careful of that. You know, it's like with... Um, uh, with you know what meteorologists talking about global warming all the time. Well, they're they're meteorologists. That's not the same as a client climate scientist. They're different things. So you have to be aware of that kind of stuff. But also, um, uh, you might want to consider the university a person's at. If a person is at you know Stanford, they could be nuts, but maybe not. They're probably worth li listening to. If someone is at the Reverend Sung Young Moon's, you know, Mooney University, they might be a brilliant person who's got some reality to share with you, or they might not be. You might want to just be skeptical. So, you know, I'm a little, you know, as I think about it, I'm a little reluctant to say, always trust these people, never trust these people, you know, because as a good skeptic, you just, the way, you know, you keep an open mind, you, you listen to the presentation, you hear the argument, and you let it filter through your brain and you worry about your own biases and then you make a you, you got to be a big boy and you make a decision does this make sense or not and if it does make sense even then it's almost like just a it, it's a tentative acceptance okay many times somebody will present me with some say some medical quacky thing that sounds like nonsense but they're promising me it's true and they so show me a study that looks pretty compelling actually wow you know there's a study here that seems to be the real deal interesting but it still seems a little too good to be true hmm well I'll say okay okay but I hold off on absolute acceptance hold off there's nothing wrong that's one thing I stress in the book another important point it's okay to say I don't know it's okay to withhold your a conclusion 
until you get more evidence, until you give it some time. Let it sink in. There, there's far too much uh, urgency people feel, this false sense of urgency where they always have to say, okay, I'll make up my mind. Uh, yeah, I believe, or no, I don't believe. No, sometimes you say, I'm not sure. I don't know. It's fine to say, I don't know. Those are beautiful words. Embrace them. There's nothing to be ashamed of. When you, when you don't know something and you say, I don't know, you're being honest, okay? <laughs> when you say something is a miracle, okay, you're not being honest, okay? Something happened, you don't know what it is, and you're applying, you're, you're transferring some sort of a, a supernatural, magical belief onto that event when you really don't know what it is, okay? A mystery is not an answer. It's okay to not know everything. I think that that is a beautiful point, that uh, I, the I don't know, the admission of ignorance is something that a lot of people are afraid of doing. Uh, I remember, uh, again, going back to anecdote land here, uh, going through my education and being startled when I went into um, college for the first time from high school, because that may very well be the first time I was presented on a regular basis with that as a response from my professors. And it, it blew my mind, because of course when you're in high school, you're working with people who have a, a bachelor's degree in their subject area and are then you know, a minor in um, pedagogy and they will teach according to what it is. And then when you get up to the college level, these are people who are, are scientists or, or, well, they have a PhD in their field. Not, I guess not everything is a science, uh, but they uh, are experts by, by definition in the subject area that they're teaching. And yet, I heard I don't know and admissions of ignorance and people saying, well, I'm not sure what the answer is to that, but thank you for asking. I'll get back to you with this, you know, something. I'll look into that and get back to you in our next class. Far more regularly than I ever remember hearing in, in high school level. I think that uh, there's a, a fair amount of honesty with coming or becoming more and more educated on a particular subject as you realize how much you don't know about it. And uh, I think that if more people were a little bit less afraid of saying, I don't know. Uh, we'd uh, have a lot fewer of these superstitions and uh, weak skeptical beliefs out there. Yep. Uh, wanted to touch on another thing here. You mentioned Star Trek. I, I also am a, a Trekkie. I have to say, though, I'm, uh, Next Generation is kind of my Trekkie uh, center. I, I dabble outside of it, but that's, that's where I'm aware. Um, but I noticed in your book that uh, you, or in Think, the, your most recent book here, that you mentioned having conversations with your children and often sort of couching them in terms of Star Trek or over an episode of Star Trek. Um, that I, I'm a, a parent. I have a three-year-old and another one on the way in about two months. And I think that uh, skeptic or teaching skepticism to your children is one of the best things that we can possibly do. Of course, there's uh, the, the risk in that they no longer just accept your, thor or your authority. Um, <laughs> that... Uh, you kind of sometimes depend upon as a parent, but um, you also are a parent, right? Yeah. Yes. That. How old are your kids? I have a little girl just turned 13, the big 13, and my son is 16, and I have an older daughter who's out of law school now, so she's all grown up. So, oh, so obviously you taught her some critical thinking. Yeah. <laughs> through law school. Um, so do you have any tips for, for parents eh, or teachers, anybody working with young children? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. First of all, uh, get your own head straight and strive to become a good skeptic. Lead by example. But, yeah, just it's like anything else. It's like um, sitting them down to teach them about saving money or good study habits or don't cross the street without looking both ways. You need to sit your children down at a very, very young age, very young age. When they can talk, start. There's no reason to wait. <laughs> And to start explaining to them that, you know, some things are real, some things are not. There's a difference between fiction and nonfiction. I read you stories at bed at night. Some of these, most of these are make-believe. Uh, sometimes they're real stories. How do we figure out the difference? And, and you need to, more, more than any, I'd say more than any skill or techniques or anything like that, you just need to uh, impress upon them how beautiful it is to have an independent mind, to be an independent thinker and to not, not feel so, so uh, chained to the herd, like you, you have to go along with what everybody else is doing, no matter how crazy it is. Because if you can, if you can put that in your child, and they go off into the world, I, I believe they're much safer. They're going to be 
they're going to be uh, set up for a better life because they're less likely to become a victim to you know con artists or crazy people out there that want to take advantage of them. So you know you want to turn your children into thinkers, thinking human beings. That's the best thing you can do as a parent. It really is. It really is because you can't teach them. You know, with my kids, I can't say, "Okay, son, don't believe in homeopathic medicine because it's silly. It's just water." Okay, that's one thing we got out of the way. But guess what? There's 950 million more medical quackery claims out there. I don't have time to go through each one. But if I can teach him to have a radar, have a filter that he automatically, this, this gauntlet in his brain that everything must run through and survive to convince him that it's real or true, if I can do that for him or my daughters, then I, I've, done, I've done a wonderful service for them because I ain't going to be there. They're going to be on their own. And so they need to be good skeptics. Otherwise, they're, you know, they're at risk. It's a terrible thing. It's one of the most... You know, I, I'm not. I don't want to be mean to parents, but it is probably, it, it definitely is uh, one of the uh, most common areas of neglect, outright childhood neglect. When you when you teach your child by example and by your words to be a passive believer, to just accept what your culture teaches you is true without questioning, without embracing doubt. When you allow that to happen to your children, man, you have you have done them a huge disservice. I love that you also discussed in your book here um, the, the social consequences that can sometimes come along with being a critical thinker and being open to these things. And it's something, you know, of course, the children deal with a lot of the, uh, the greatest amount of uh, very, very harsh social situations. Um, elementary school, as we all know, is absolutely brutal. But uh, it takes a fair amount of confidence um, and teaching kids to, to continue to question and challenge things. I love the, the quote from your book here. Um, it says, uh, remember that you're not rude for doing nothing more than asking people to explain, defend, or prove a belief that they are trying to talk you into accepting. When people are challenging you with a, a, a belief or trying to get you to believe it, that is one thing, um, and, and that is certainly absolutely true. Uh, but there is a, a fair amount of uh, the social perception, as, as we talked about earlier, the know-it-all feeling that comes if you challenge a belief that they're simply professing. And, of course, with what you do when you're writing, that... that uh, comes into play. Have you personally struggled um, or suffered any major consequences for what you write about? Um, I've had some kind of weird threats and stuff like that, but nothing. Nah, I mean, nothing I couldn't handle. You know, nothing. I, I've probably been ostracized a little bit here and there, but nothing I couldn't. Ha I'm an introvert anyway, so it's like I'm I'm fine being alone. You know, I don't have that. I don't have that deep need to constantly be surrounded by people who are patting me on the back or something like that. I'm fine just hanging out in the library by myself with a stack of books, you know. So I'm okay that way. But um, yeah, overall, overall, it's been fine. I, I think part of the reason is that once people actually read my books, you know, I almost almost every time the people who attack me or come at me hard don't they haven't read anything I've written. They're just going off some, you know, just judging me by the cover or whatever. Because if you actually read my books and you, you listen to me speak, you know I'm the kind of guy who doesn't try, I'm not even interested in debating you or having an argument with you. It doesn't turn me on to beat you in an argument because I, you know, I don't need it for my own well-being. That doesn't make me, you know, it doesn't make my day to beat somebody up intellectually. I want to help people. I'm, my, my brand of skepticism is not a slap in the face. It's a helping hand up. You know, I'm trying to help people. So... What I normally do is approach people with questions more than declaring, you know, that I know what's right because, hey, guess what? I don't know everything. And I also, I always try to, whether it's, whether it's psychics or ESP or medical quackery or religions or anything, whenever I'm with someone, when I'm face-to-face -face with someone who clearly has a, a deep emotional investment in it, they feel passionate about it, and I'm in danger of upsetting them and maybe making them angry or whatever. I always try to reposition the whole dynamic. I try to tell them and make it clear to them. And it's true. I'm not playing games with them. It's true. I say, look, you know, let's be let's be clear about something. You and I are not butting heads here. We're not having an argument. I don't even care if you want to have an argument. We're not going to. Because guess what? You and I are on the same side here. 
we are both trying to get to what's real or true, right? You want to know, you're, you say your claim is real. You say Bigfoot really is out there. I don't think he is, but you know what? If he is, I want to know about it. And guess what? If he's not out there, don't you want to know about that so you can stop wasting all your time? You know, and that applies to Bigfoot, gods, whatever. And so I try to get us on the same side. And so we're looking in the same direction together rather than just, you know, slamming heads. Because when you make people angry, it just, it just makes them more, you know, more entrenched. It makes them more committed and more stubborn about it. So I always try to keep encounters as friendly as possible, as positive as possible. And even if they walk away still saying, oh, you know, that's ridiculous, guy. You don't know what you're talking about. I know that many, many times I have planted seeds of thought that may take, you know, months or years to germinate, but in many cases they do. They do. And that's good. You know, I've done, a, I've done something, you know, nice for that person. If I've, I've, like I said, planted a seed of thought that can help them maybe see things more clearly long after I'm gone out of their life and moved on. So, yeah, you can all, I've, I've been around some pretty rough characters in talking about these, you know, touchy subjects. And yet, I've, n I've always managed to, to you know, sidestep the, uh, the aggression and, and do a little mental jiu-jitsu, you know. So it's, it's, not, it's not absolutely, uh, you know, it doesn't, doesn't have to be negative. It really doesn't. I, I've proven that over the years. You can be positive with this stuff. And I think many times it's, it's, it's fantastic when you are positive about it and respectful of other people because that helps to win them over to what you're trying to get them to see. And that's the, is skepticism good for you, man? I'm not trying to, you know, sign you up and take 10% of your income. I'm trying to pass on some knowledge here that is good for you. That's all. It's free, you know? Well, guy, I only have two more things, really, to uh, to cover with you. Um, and uh, I guess I'll, I'll save the, the obvious one for last. But uh, the, the first thing I wanted to say is uh, I love in your book, um, I, or in your books, how you... You cover things not just in sort of a philosophical sense, but you you tie them to a way that makes them relevant to the the person. I mean, even just now you were talking about belief in Bigfoot, which seems uh, to be a rather odd thing to be incredibly relevant to a person. But you said you know it didn't just say you shouldn't believe it. It's well, don't you want to make sure you're not wasting your time? And I love that in Think you talk quite a bit about the other things that people do waste. I mean, specifically, you bring up also the the tithing or the people, you know, Benny Hinn getting every loose nickel out of people. Uh, I think, uh, I, I shouldn't say I think, I am really impressed with the way that you tie in the the real motivating factors for why this is important to, to people. Um, is there anything else that uh, it really sort of springs to mind when you, you talk about, uh, I, I mean, setting aside some of the, the real out there um, weak skepticism, anything else that really motivates you to, to help people use skepticism more in their daily life uh, and get things um, working in their favor more often? Yeah, it, it's uh, too often... You know, guys like you and I might think of this all as just an intellectual game that, you know, we're just tackling these people who are making these radical claims. But there really is a real nitty-gritty, down-to-earth, down practical side to all this because you can apply skeptical thinking to business investments, um, career choices, you know, uh, who you date. You can, there's all kinds of applications. It's, it literally is. Uh, the best thing you can do for yourself because if you're thinking like a scientist, if you're looking for evidence, if you're questioning conclusions, if you're willing to run tests and experiments, if you're, if you're willing to do these things in one way or another in your daily life, man, you, you are going to come out ahead in the long run. You really are. So don't think it's just all an intellectual exercise about, you know, uh, what's up with the Bermuda Triangle. No, it's not. It's about everything you do in your life because you when someone talks to you when a salesman talks to you and you're thinking of buying a washing machine okay there are biases going on in your head you're looking at the guy's shoes and his tie and it may influence whether or not you buy the super duper deluxe washing machine or the economy washing machine I mean you gotta be aware of these things you know it costs you money when your child wants to go to this college instead of that college. You need to analyze what's going on in her head. Why does she want to do that? 
and why are you leaning towards this other college? What's going on? You know what? What is going on in our heads? Because that's why so so much of my book Think is not just it's not just about extraordinary claims. It's about human brain biology. You know, <laughs> and because it, when, like like I said, when you don't understand how your eyes, how your memory, how these things are working every day of your life, if, when you are just clueless and you don't really know how fallible memory is or your vision, how easily it is to be fooled by what's really right in front of your face, if you don't understand, if you don't have a clue about these things, you, it's like walking. It's like walking around with the lights turned off. You know, half half your day. I mean, how safe is that? How practical is that? How efficient is that? You know, it's not. So yeah, skeptical thinking is for everyone. And even if you have, you know, I, I won't skirt around the issue, even if your religion is the big one, even if you're very religious and you say, there's no way I'm letting go of my religion. I love being at church or at my mosque and I love being around the people. There's no way. You know, the tradition means too much to me. It gives me this these warm feelings of comfort, and I'm just not letting it go. I'm not even going to go there. To those people, I say, okay, fine. Then don't go there. But you know what? Do yourself a favor. Become a good skeptic in every other aspect of your life, okay? Even if you can't achieve absolute consistency, that's fine, because a little skepticism is a hell of a lot better than no skepticism, okay? And a lot of skepticism is a lot better than a little skepticism. So as much as you can... As much as you can muster, do it. Skepticism is good for you. Your point there about sales is a fantastic one. I, I can say from my personal experience, having worked in sales, that uh, if you're if you're not aware of the um, psychological forces that are in play in sales, you can be absolutely certain, at least, that the person selling to you is. They've they've been taught these things. Because that is a huge part of any sales education program. Teaching people. Uh, I mean, all sorts of things, mirroring and, and any kind of thing you can imagine. They've been taught how to manipulate you with the way that they look, the way that you think, and, and all of these biases. So that's, that's a great, very practical example. Um, so I, well, I, I don't want to take any more of your time. I, I want to say thank you for coming on. And before I, I let you go, this is the, the last question that I saved here, is, uh, of course, you um, are not an old man. You have a 13-year-old a here, so a lot of life uh, and a lot of things to do. What are you working on now? What's the next book that we're going to see? Yeah, a couple of projects in the works. Um, the one I'm really focused on right now, excited about, is actually a science fiction novel. It's, um, you know, I'm changing gears here, trying fiction. Uh, I've got 100,000 words in the can. And I'm going through the re revision process now, and uh, it's it's been cool. It's a cool ride. It's a completely different kind of writing, and I'm, I've really enjoyed it. It's um, stretching my brain in new ways. You know, I love it. I really, I have no idea if this will ever be published. You know, <laughs> but sometimes you got to go for it and do what you want to do. So I'm I'm taking a shot at it. Yeah, and I have um, my next nonfiction book. There's a couple I'm I'm you know tinkering with, but. It's probably going to be one about human divisions, how, how made-up divisions cause so many problems for us. And they're so prominent and important in our lives that many people don't realize that these are things we just pulled out of our butts. They're just made up. You know, I'm talking about national borders, um, racial divisions, uh, religious divisions, um, and uh, other things. And that book, um, I, I really want to show people and convince people from a scientific reality based perspective that you know we we really should feel a lot more like one big family sharing this one planet as corny as that sounds you know I'm not just saying rah rah let's all hold hands I'm saying I'm saying rah rah let's all hold hands because it's logical scientific and it makes sense and it's who we really are we're just pretending to be this this you know diced up, chopped up species that is, so, you know, so diff we're all so different from one another, you know, because of languages and music and the kind of pants we wear or whatever. So hopefully it's a book that can do some more good, bring us bring us a little closer together. I look forward to that. I, I love your uh, your race and reality book and the book, uh, I think it was in 50 Popular Beliefs that uh, people think are true. You brought, uh, you had the uh, example of the uh, Haitian friend of yours that changes race by getting on an airplane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was an 
amazing story. My wife is a uh, social studies teacher, and she actually uh, uses that. She has her students read that um, uh, to uh, uh, sort of help explain this point. And sometime in the future, we're going to tackle the the issues of race and and things racism um, and the other uh, associated prejudices uh, there or I guess therewith. So uh, at that point, I will certainly contact you and uh, have you come on again. Uh, this time, I'll give you a little bit more advance notice. Um, so thank you again for coming with uh, such short notice to be uh, a guest on my show here and thank you very much. I look forward to uh, everything that you're working on in the future as well and uh, let me be um, or, or put this officially on the record that uh, if you're looking for somebody to uh, give you a review of that novel before it hits the publishers I'm more than happy to uh, offer my services. So. Uh, um, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And uh, again, this has been Inspiring Doubt and Guy P. Harrison, uh, author of the the newest book, Think, and several other ones, 50 Popular Beliefs That People Think Are True, 50 Simple Questions for Every Christian, 50 Reasons People Give for Believing in a God and Race and Reality. I can't uh, recommend any of them uh, enough. They, they're all fantastic books. And what's great is they're quick, easy reads. So I think that uh, everybody should spend some time reading the books by um, you, uh, Mr. Guy P. Harrison. Thank you again for joining us. Well, thanks, man. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Great questions. Enjoyed it. All right. Have a great day. So one last time, this is Greg Bray, host of Inspiring Doubt. Just wanted to say a special thanks to the viewers for tuning in today and for sharing this video on uh, Facebook or whatever, uh, uh, Twitter, whatever social media platform you like. And remember to check us out, www.inspiringdoubt.com is the Facebook page. We are Inspiring Doubt on Google+. Plus. We are Inspiring Doubt on YouTube. And we are at Inspiring Doubt on Twitter. Also, again, my name is Greg Bray. Find me on Facebook. Send me a friend request. I would love to interact with you in, in now and in the future. Many of our shows are going to incorporate a live interactive uh, opportunity. In fact, the standard for the show will be live where we can have viewers, uh, we can be watching the viewer comments and interacting. This one being the first episode, being that our studio had some technical difficulties down in Florida, it ended up being a pre-recorded interview, but typically you can expect to see a live format for this show. And I, I look very much forward to having more excellent guests in the future and wonderful conversations. Couldn't be more excited for Inspiring Doubt to continue. Thank you for joining us.